So, so um, tomorrow is when the world celebrates Earth Day, and uh, I thought I would give an Earth Day talk today. And it makes me happy to do that and to think about it. And uh, as part of my preparations for talking about Earth Day, I got up early and went for a hike up in the hills here in the forest and grasslands. And, and, uh, and anyway, I know some of you know it, uh, Edgewood. And a uh, tremendous amount of deer if you go early in the morning. It was quite something to see all the deer. Lovely. And... Um, <clears throat> So, but what is uh, talking about the earth and the natural world, talking about Gaia, celebrating it, have to do with Buddhist practice? So, when I was somewhat young and maybe a little bit more bold than I should be, uh, I had breakfast with a very famous Cambodian teacher, Buddhist teacher monk named Maha Gosananda. And, uh, and uh, he was kind of like the Mahatma Gandhi of or Dalai Lama of Cambodia, a very important person, uh, one of the few of the revered great monks of Cambodia who survived the Pol Pot massacre. And he survived because he was in Thailand. And uh, Jack Hornfield knew him there. They were kind of fellow monks at some point, and with Ajahn Chah. And he's a wonderful man, and I was very fortunate to have met him. And so sitting at breakfast, and I'd learned that uh, uh, this was in the early 1990s, that he was, he certainly been back in Cambodia for some time. Was, by this time, he was the patriarch of Cambodian Buddhism and a very important person. And, um, and he um, was involved in planting trees around Cambodia. I think much of the trees, forests have been devastated. So in my kind of curious, bold way, and wanted to kind of probe a little bit and see what would come out, I said to him, um, you know, you're the you know, leader of Buddhism in, in Cambodia and revered in your practice. And what are you doing planting trees? You know, you should be practicing or teaching Dharma or something, right? And he said, uh, he's, very, he's very, you know, I think he's a brilliant man, deep practice, but, you know, he's also very sparse in his words, at least to me. <laughs> <laughs> And he said, um, uh, the Buddha was born under a tree. He was enlightened under a tree. He taught under trees. And he died under trees. Trees are very important for the Dharma. So, um, and there's a long tradition of uh, monastics being forest monastics. Monks and nuns who go into the forest to practice. And uh, are inspired by that. And it's very meaningful for them. And coming out of Thailand in particular, there's a very strong forest tradition that's come to the West with the uh, disciples of Ajahn Chah. Here in California, it's up in Ukiah, there's a monastery called Abhayagiri, that's a forest monk monastery. And, and in, in Auburn area, there's another one from the same tradition for nuns that exists up there, forest nuns. And, um, and uh, one of the modern Thai monks who really emphasized trying to save the environment in Thailand, uh, he wrote this. Um, the entire cosmos is a cooperative. The sun, the moon, and the stars live together as a cooperative. The same is true of humans and animals, trees, and the earth. If our life is not based on this truth, then we will perish. Ajahn Buddhadasa, and um, in a, 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 a essay he wrote that's titled "Buddhists and the Care of Nature." I kind of like the title. So a cooperative, we're all in it together, and there is not really a strong separation between you know humans, self, and the natural world. Though I think what's all too easy, especially in our modern world, is to live a life that feels quite disconnected from the natural world. And part of the uh, function of being a forest monastic is to go and practice in the woods and the forest in order to feel not only the connection there, but the ways in which they uh, were supported, nourished, inspired even in practice in the natural world. It's a very important part of it. 
it's a kind of a rediscovering for some people of who we are that can't be done very well if we're kind of living uh, too much in a, maybe in an urban setting, <coughs> quite divorced and separated from, from the natural world, living in asphalt and concrete and things. And um, in the sense of uh, the intimacy, inti- intimate connection of what Buddha Dasa calls the cooperative world that we live in, uh, is this, uh, presented in the Buddhist uh, uh, origin story. I think most religions have an a origin myth that they've come up with, and so Buddhism has one as well. And uh, it shows the mutual and re- the story clearly shows the mutual and reciprocal relationship between humans and the natural world, and um, and how human behavior impacts and shapes the natural world, which in return impacts human beings. So it's reciprocal and mutual, it's going around and around. And what I find remarkable about uh, uh, some of these ancient myths, that uh, you know, uh, I think. It's, hundred years ago, there were people in the West who heard these stories called the myths and kind of, you know, thought they were quaint and, uh, you know, kind of bizarre maybe. Uh, but uh, if we think of them as, um, as myths, myths sometimes come true. And, uh, and it all too painfully, things that in the past were stories they made up maybe, um, because of the size of the human population on this planet, the level of impact that we have is mythic in nature. And, um, and uh, so certain things are coming true that uh, never could have been true before. Um, you know, some, some, things, some, some, some of the ancient myths that are filled with stories of people flying or traveling through mountains or traveling under water or somehow sending their voice to other places or... Um, you know, it's just phenomenal, you know, that these things are true today, that we can do all these things. And uh, we have uh, instantaneous, at the click of a, you know, of a keyboard, we can have most of human knowledge in instance can be in, in our hands. I mean, you have to be pretty psychic in the midst to be able to have access to all those things. And, um, and then uh, the ability to buy things has gotten to be mythic proportions. <laughs> you know, I mean, who could have, again, just you click a button, and, you know, just you, you're on some websites, some websites make it so easy, you know, just click that button, and a day later it comes. And, you know, most of uh, consumer goods that are produced in the globe can show up, you know, you know, pretty easily. And, um, and, you know, we have children going up now who take this as being normal, take it so much for granted. So it's, it, what was once a myth is now seen as being normal. But these, these, uh, to have these myths become true this way is at a tremendous cost. And now the cost has become uh, uh, bringing, uh, bringing these kind of myths into reality as well, into truth. And, this is, uh, and so this story, the Buddhist uh, origin story, uh, can be listened to, uh, read, a little bit like um, of, uh, presaging of what was going to, what's coming, or what's come already for our modern world. That uh, you know, kind of talks about it in a very different way. That um, the um, so this dynamic, we're interactive relationship between the natural world, the animate, animate, animate and the inanimate world, the human world, all these kind of come together in a very powerful and important way. Before I tell you the, or the myth story, there's one little story that's told, another little fable, I guess, in the Buddhist texts, that once upon a time there was a very large fig tree. You can't, uh, it's a mythic fig tree because uh, it's larger than you think. It spreads spread out over the lands, you know, many many leagues, the branches and them, and um, <clears throat> and it had very big figs, and people could just come along and pick the figs, and more figs would grow. People would eat, go away, come back, more figs. It's kind of like 
this is kind of like the, gold, the goose that gave the golden egg story. And so, but a little different. But, uh, and then at some point, uh, some man who was greedy came along and stuffed himself on figs. And when he was finished, he reached up and he broke off the branch that he took the figs from. And that's the day that the fig tree stopped producing figs. So this idea of a cornucopia of support that we get that uh, for human beings, for life on this planet, um, if we break it, maybe it stops providing, is kind of the, the idea of this kind of this story. So the Buddhist origin story begins um, at a time when there was a kind of heavenly paradise. Some origin stories that start that way. It all started off great. <laughs> um, and then it describes how it was lost. So this heavenly, uh, in this uh, or, uh, or, in paradise, uh, there was no nothing yet, hardly. There were no moon and stars, suns, so there's no light. Was there, is there a darkness if there's no light to compare it to? And, um, uh, but there were two things. There were uh, um, beings uh, uh, who had no body, no, uh, dis, not disembodied, but uh, um, uh, mind-only beings. There was no, they had no physical body, they were only mind. I'm not quite sure what they look like. <laughs> and um, and uh, they lived, they fed on their own joy. Isn't that cool? They just had a lot of joy and that was what they ate. And they were self-luminous. So there didn't, didn't, didn't need to be any light. I, so I don't know what it means to be no light, but they're self-luminous. No bodies to see, but anyway, this is how they're described. <laughs> self-luminous, feeding on their own joy, floating around. But the other thing there was at this point in the whole universe was a vast expanse of water, just water, in all directions. As time went along, there started, to be, and we're talking about now, this whole story is probably taking longer than it took for um, for us to go from just a, a, a bath of amino acids <laughs> to modern life, you know, and human life, and you know, so you know that happens over a few billion years, right? And um, so this is probably a, uh, the time span. The time span of these Buddhist myths are much longer. So you have to appreciate that this is kind of a sp sped up version of something that happened very, very slowly. So uh, over time, uh, on the surface of this water, there started to be this very thin film formed. A kind, it's, the text says it's like um, the this, this skin on top of uh, boiled milk. And, uh, and then one of those uh, mind-only beings got curious. And somehow, they, 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 it doesn't explain how this happens, but they have no bodies, but at this point, they, they dipped its finger. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and, taste, and tasted the, this, this you know, surface skin. And it was delicious, like pure honey. It tasted smell well, it smelled well, it looked beautiful, and just beautiful kind of thing. And th this being then started craving more of it and started taking big chunks of it and eating more. And then the other beings floating around saw this and said, oh. So they started, they put their finger in and they started, you know, eating it and the craving arose. And as craving arose and they started eating more and more, um, first what happened is that uh, they became... Um, started to become coarser. They started to develop a little bit more physical bodies that were coarser and coarser. But, um, and, uh, and so they kept eating and eating and coarser and coarser. And uh, as they got, 
and as their craving got stronger, then the the that beautiful tasty uh, s- silk of you know skin on top of the water disappeared. Ah. But what replaced it was mushrooms. <laughs> And a little bit coarser themselves than the skin, the water. But the mushrooms uh, were also tasty, really tasty. <laughs> and they say the text says like honey. And uh, so they started eating those, and that was delicious. And more craving arose, and they got coarser bodies. But as their bodies got coarser, uh, they started to see that it started to differentiate. And as they differentiated, these beings started to say. Uh, that person is beautiful and that person's ugly. And those who were said to be beautiful were disparaging and looked down at the people they thought were beings they thought were ugly. And so as they were, their conceit, their arrogance and disparaging arose in the community, then the mushrooms disappeared. And what we get the sense of now is that human craving, human ethical conduct, disparaging of others has an impact on the natural world. It doesn't go, you know, it, you know, it has no impact at all, what goes on inside. So now the mushrooms disappeared. And, the peop- and those beings were pretty, pretty distraught at first because they, they'd lost their ability to feed on their own joy. So they kind of were losing their own capacity of luminosity, of self-feeding joy and floating around. And so then uh, uh, the text calls it creepers. Creepers replaced the mushrooms, creeping plants. And those creeping plants were also quite good. <laughs> but I think that, you know, each time it gets a little bit harder to harvest them and gather them. You know, the, you know one you just scoop up on your finger, you know, mushrooms that take a little more work to pick, and then creepers, you have to break them off. It's a little harder to do it. And uh, so they started eating them, but they were pretty delicious. And so what happens is their bodies got coarser and coarser. And... Um, and at some point, uh, they got coarse enough <clears throat> uh, that uh, they were <clears throat> uh, uh, hating each other for those who were, you know, because some were beauty and beautiful, they said, and some were ugly. And I got kind of ugly with this kind of behavior. <clears throat> so then the creepers disappeared. Then rice appeared. And, um, but the rice was more work to harvest. However, the rice was pretty tasty. And they had no husk and no bran. You just pull it off the plant and eat it. It was ready to eat, cooked, <laughs> cooked and all. And, um, and if you took it off, then within 12 hours, it had grown back again, more rice. And so just replenishing. It was really easy to put your hands up and eat, eat more. and like Maybe scooping blueberries off a blueberry bush and stuffing yourself. And so it was rice. But as they got craving and wanting more and eating this delicious food, their bodies got even coarser and and they started to differentiate sexually, getting sexual organs. And then, you know, I don't think there were any clothes yet. And so that uh, produced a certain kind of interest in each other. <laughs> and so then uh, there started to be uh, uh, sex. And, uh, but they were doing it, there were no houses or anything, so they were just doing it publicly. <laughs> And, uh, and then uh, people who saw others having sex would say, shame on you, that's disgusting. <laughs> it's getting worse and worse, right? <laughs> Better and worse. <laughs> Simultaneously. <laughs> and, then, um, and so they built houses for each other, for themselves, so they could have sex in private. But once they had houses, then they said, why do we just go out, why do we go out twice a day and harvest rice to eat? What if we just go and get a whole bunch, and just get it for many days, just gather it all together, and then we just stay in our houses and just do what house, we do in houses. And, um, and so there was more greed and acquisitiveness. Well, then the rice um, started to grow husk and bran. And it had to be harvested. It was, you have to you know, willow it, winnow it, and you know, prepare it more, and you had to cook it after a while. And, uh, and then the rice lost the ability to regrow on rice uh, uh, kernels on grain on the same plant. And so as soon as it was harvested, the plant would die. 
so you had to grow, you had to farm, farm then. So you had to do more work and, you know, you know be more engaged. <clears throat> and since they had to work their lands, then they decided to have private property. Uh-oh. <laughs> and, uh, and so they made boundaries and this is my private property and this is mine. And, uh, and uh, that went okay for a while. But then uh, people started stealing from other people's private property. And as they were stealing, then uh, 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 the people started punishing the people who were stealing. But that didn't seem to help too much. And so there was all this theft was going on. So and the people didn't like to be punishing each other. So they elected a uh, leader whose job, primary job was to punish. <laughs> And uh, and um, and that's the uh, end of the story. <laughs> uh, it, 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 it kind of the, the teaching goes on in a certain way, and maybe I'll get back to the rest of it. But that's the really the extent of the origin story. It's embedded in a larger context in a particular discourse by the Buddha, and I'll explain that larger context in a moment. But here we have uh, you know the story over eons of time where people's uh, craving, people's disparagement of each other and hatred of each other, people's uh, uh, lust perhaps, people's unethical act actions of uh, stealing and then lying about stealing and all this stuff, um, does, isn't, uh, it doesn't go without impact on the world around us. It has an effect on the world. And if we look at the modern world, uh, it's pretty easy to analyze that uh, um, that humans have a, f a fair degree of, gr of craving and greed, and maybe not you all people here, but there are people you know, in, the, in the wider world who that's the case, and that uh, that drives a tremendous amount of activity, of uh, consumption, of uh, destruction of the natural world. All kinds of things happen, and some of it not intentional, but this, uh, to have seven billion people on this planet consuming all these goods, that uh, one person's little greed, if, uh, if I'm the only greedy person in the whole world and decide to just, you know, get a gas-guzzling car in my greed, and there no one else has any cars, you know, it's not going to affect the atmosphere that much. But you have, you know, millions and millions and millions, billions of people with cars, then the accumulative impact is so great. So the accumulative impact of greed has, uh, is uh, monumental, mythic in nature in the size compared to what it would have been even a few hundred years ago. Uh, and um, <clears throat> so in some sense, this, uh, these things are, are coming true. So greed and hatred and delusion that humans have, the aggregate of the, everyone having it together and, and in a sense cooperating in their, in their greed, cooperating in their hatred, uh, it adds up uh, to something that is changing our environment now in global, at a global scale. There's a second myth that is not an origin story exactly, but can be seen as a continuation of the first one. And, um, and what's interesting about the second one is that uh, for most of the story, nature has no role. The external world, the natural world that supports us has no role. The first story the natural world does have a role. It provides sustenance and food. And uh, maybe not coincidentally, it's all vegan. <laughs> you know, in this Buddha, early Buddhist uh, story. And uh, so, uh, but in the second story, um, it, you know, if you see it as a continuity, the first one ended with the election of a leader. The second one starts much later and uh, when uh, an elected leadership had changed to hereditary uh, monarchy. And uh, it's also a mythic time because the length, life, lifespan of human beings in this, when the story begins is 84,000 years. <clears throat> so uh, pretty good. It's considered ideal to live that long. <laughs> And, uh, and it's all kind of a paradise of sorts with the, the king is very benign, 
uh, takes care of everyone, if there's poverty, gives the poor people land to farm and so they can build themselves up and take care of themselves. And so all, they live very righteously. And that goes on for seven generations of kings. And each time there's a transition to a new king, uh, there's ministers explain this is what you have to do to keep everything in harmony and you have to support the poor. Well, the seventh one comes along and he neglects to do that. And so the poor uh, are not supported, are not helped out of their poverty. And so in their desperation, the poor steal. And uh, because they steal, then there's punishment. And because there's punishment, then the thieves, these poor people, say, well, we have, to, we have to defend ourselves. And so in order to be able to, I guess, probably just survive, so they got weapons. But in order to get away from what they do, they started killing the people they stole from. So pretty bad. So killing started to happen. Well, this also impacted uh, generations as the time went along. And so lifespans began to decrease. And then, um, uh, and then as time went along, people started lying a lot. And they started uh, uh, stealing even more. And they started engaging in sexual misconduct. And as, it, as uh, you know, millennials went along, they started doing things like um, uh, harsh speech, slanderous speech. They started to have a lot of, um, uh, uh, you know, more, even more greed and more hate. And it's kind of got worse and worse, people's uh, mental, ethical actions. And um, as over, over time, as they did that, lifespans got worse, shorter and shorter and shorter. Until finally, lifespans got to be only 10 years long. The, humans, the length of a human lifetime was 10 years. And... Um, Kind of like pets, you know. <clears throat> and, um, and there everybody was just killing each other everywhere. It was just an awful, you know, period of strife and violence. <clears throat> and, and, and in the story at this point, there's, nature doesn't appear. It's kind of, I think it's kind of telling that there's no connection to the natural world. But then there are some of those people that say, this is terrible. And says, it says all these nice words. It says they go out into the woods and the mountains, the rivers, the jungles. They go out into the natural world and they say, what if we instead live out here in nature and what if we don't kill each other? <laughs> what if we don't um, steal, engage in sexual misconduct or lie or have harsh speech or uh, divisive speech or idle chatter or covetousness or ill will for each other, or uh, wrong views. What if we don't have that? And as they don't have that, lo and behold, over the generations, uh, the, life, uh, the lifespan begins to increase again. And they get long, like, longer and longer, until eventually they live to be 84,000 years again. So maybe these are quaint stories, but a few things about them is that uh, uh, the Buddha in his teaching puts tremendous emphasis on what we, and we can call ethics. And that's kind of his measure and what he puts em importance on. That human ethical conduct is actually extremely important. And uh, if we're not careful with our ethics, that it has an impact on ourselves in a negative way, and it has negative impact on our environment that we're in whether it's our local env most local environment and the, few, the relationships we have with people around us, whether it's more extensive environment going out into our towns and, and countries or in the whole globe now with uh, the way that consumerism affects everyone, the economy affects everyone, that uh, you know, we have this huge global impact now on climate change and even independent of climate change, the degree to which uh, we're causing damage in the world is phenomenal. I was quite uh, disturbed to uh, learn re only recently about uh, all these microplastics that are ending up in the ocean. And, uh, you, know, um, you know, I have clothes, which I have plastic clothes. Probably most of us here, many of us here probably have plastic clothes, right? We don't like to say that. It's kind of, a, you know, I'm wearing plastic clothes. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's, it's um, and... Um, and, you know, and uh, you go through the wash and just ever so slight, you know, a little bit of wearing off, wearing off, wearing off, teeny, teeny bit. 
you know, just your clothes is not an issue. But the aggregate of everyone doing that, the total building up over the decades, uh, is huge. And so this spreads out into the oceans and into the fish and everything in the animal life. And, and so we have all these unintended consequences of how we live our life. So, um, so this interactive mode, this relationship. So the Buddha puts a tremendous emphasis on, then, on ethics and caring for ethical life. And um, now if it's enough just to stop being greedy to make a change on the environment like, this, like these uh, stories tell, I don't know. But, um, but certainly we have to, you know, if we want to look at the human origins for our environmental, the environmental damage that goes on on the planet, then we have to take a good look at the role of human desire, human craving, human ill will, and also what Buddhism called delusion, calls delusion or ignorance. The degree to which we uh, don't pay attention, uh, sometimes quite willfully, to what the impact our life has on the wider, wider world. We don't have impact about the, where the production come from, uh, the resources that are used to, to provide us with the goods that we that base our life on. And we don't pay attention to where it goes when we finish using it. Other people are supposed to take care of that. And uh, it's a little bit symbolic, I think, this idea of this microplastics, you know, that, uh, you know, I had no idea. I was completely ignorant about this until this last year. So the, so the Buddhist analysis is about, you know, focuses everything back on the ethical roots inside of the human being. Buddhism is associated with being kind of peaceful, harmonious, maybe meditating, working on yourself, and, uh, which is nice. And so perhaps a little bit passive around st standing up and addressing the issues in our society and our world. So this is what now has to do with the, uh, the larger context of this origin story I told you that um, is um, uh, the discourse that it's in. It's called the Discourse on the Knowledge of Beginnings, a Ganya Sutta. It's in the Long Discourses of the Buddha. And it begins with uh, two young Brahmins. So Brahmins are, belong to the priest class of ancient India and uh, there were four classes at the time of the Buddha. There was the priest cl uh, class, there was the warrior class, there was the merchant class or the trader class, and then there was the servant class or the worker class, the manual class. And, um, and there was a vying for superiority between the, the warrior class and the Brahmin priest class. But the Brahmins clearly saw themselves as the elite and wanted to be treated that way and, and, um, and um, the elite superior class of the time. And so uh, these two Brahmins became uh, uh, Buddhist monks. And they were new monks. And they came to the Buddha and explained to him, uh, the Brahmin, you know, we're now Buddhist monks, but our Brahmin people, our Brahmin priests, uh, they're criticizing us tremendously. They're saying that we're the uh, we're the superior class, and now you have become the contempt, contemptible class. So, you know, you're the awful class. You're terrible class. You're, and, it, and you guys, you, the, these Buddhist uh, monastics are pathetic. <laughs> and, um, and it has all these kind of, you know, uh, powerful negative derogatory terms they're referring to them. And, they, and, they, and the Brahmins say, the Brahmins tell us that we are born from Brahma's God's Brahma's mouth, and we're the true heir to Brahma. But you, Buddhist monastics, are vile beings born from the feet of Brahma. The ancient, some ancient Indian idea is that the origins of human beings came from different parts of Brahma's body. And so, uh, and to be born from the feet was considered to kind of the most impure place to be born from. And so it was really laying into these Buddhists, these Brahmins, you know, and criticizing them for becoming monks and how terrible they are. And um, so the Buddha uh, doesn't just kind of like look at his own reaction and practice equanimity and say, mm, okay, so let's get peaceful here. Um, 
he he replies back. He's, first, he's, he's completely dismisses this myth of the Brahmins. This myth is, you know, he just says, it can't be true, and he has logic to explain how it you know, can't be true, what they're saying. And, um, and then he says, um, uh, isn't it true that uh, Brahmins sometimes kill, sometimes steal, sometimes engage in sexual misconduct, sometimes lie, since it goes on and on. And uh, yes, that sometimes they do. And is it true that sometimes they don't? Yes, it's true. Sometimes they don't. Some of them don't. Is it true that some of the people of the warrior class sometimes kill, sometimes don't? Some of them steal, some don't? It goes the same thing. Yes, it's true. Is it true that some, some of the people <clears throat> of the merchant or trader class, that um, some of them are involved in killing and stealing and sexual misconduct and these things, <clears throat> and some are not? Oh, yes. And isn't it true that some people of the manual working class do the same thing? Some of them kill and some of them don't. Some of them, you know, yes. And the Buddha said something like, well, um, uh, everyone, uh, that, for the Buddha, that's what's the important criteria for measuring someone. Those who are involved in the unethical behavior, they are not noble people. They're ignoble which is kind of a strong thing to say. And those who are involved in the ethical things, he says, those are the noble people. So the Buddha is willing to differentiate people in our society in society, between those who are kind of maybe a more praiseworthy than others, but it's completely based on their ethics. And it doesn't matter what class of society they came from. It only matters how, what, what their behavior is, what their ethics is. And, um, and so it's in this line. So he, he comes back and really pushes back at this myth and story and idea that the Brahmins have, that they're superior. He'll have nothing to do with it. So it's a pushing against the elite of his time and saying, you know, it's not, you know. So that's a kind of a, a certain kind of activist stance of standing up and speaking up quite strongly. And it's in that context in, uh, to, to kind of counter this myth that the uh, Brahmins had, that they, they were born from Brahma's mouth, that the Buddha offers his own um, uh, 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 origin story. And, um, and so he's offering a different origin story, which reinforces the importance of ethics and how important this is in this story. And as he goes along, he gets the he and the kind of story ends with kind of ends with this idea that um, that uh, you know they, they elected a leader to help with the punishment. Then the Buddha goes on to say uh, to explain a uh, play a very common Indian game, a linguistic game, which is to make up um, etymologies for words. And uh, and so he explains how each of the four classes how they got their names. You see, in, the, in the India, often they're seen as being people who are born, it's hereditary, whether you're born into these classes. But for uh, the Buddha, uh, they're functional names. They're based on what people do. So the Buddha is willing to have names for people, uh, but it only sees them as functional. It's true as long as they do that work, or do those activities. But there's, that's not inherently who they are. And it doesn't, it doesn't you know, travel down from one generation to the next, this hereditary kind of classes. And, um, but so then he kind of does an interesting little linguistic game with the Brahmins. He says, as for the Brahmin class, originally um, uh, the word Brahma, Brahman comes from some Indian word that sounds a little bit like that, that can mean to meditate. They were the meditators. <laughs> 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 and, um, you know, so I can imagine that some of these Brahmins who heard this, oops, <laughs> meditate. You know, they're known mostly for their uh, being ritual masters, doing lots of rituals. And so he's kind of saying, you know, you know, he's kind of saying, you probably forgot about your origins. You, you began as meditators in the woods, in the forest. So, two things I wanted to say about this, about this, uh, kind of summarize this now as we end. One is this idea that, um, 
these ancient Buddhist myths uh, that uh, point to the idea of a uh, reciprocal, mutual, interactive relationship between human behavior and human ethics and the natural world. As one changes, the other changes. And if the human ethical activity is unethical um, or uh, driven by greed, hate, and delusion and ignorance, it has, can have a negative effect on our natural world. And, and then the opposite, and when it starts being ethical, it can have a beneficial effect on the natural world. As the natural world is improved, then that reciprocal relationship helps uh, humans improve. Um, my walk in the woods today, uh, I could feel a little bit that I became a better person. It was nice to be out there than if I'd walked in the asphalt and back alleys of Redwood City. And um, so, um, so to care for this, be, be sensitive and careful and caring of this reciprocal relationship and not to be ignorant of it or uncaring for it. And the other about these stories is, about, is that the Buddha spoke up. He spoke up uh, uh, explicitly and creatively against some of the uh, myths of his time, some of the, um, and, uh, you know, to protest and offered an ethical analysis of what goes on. And I would suspect that uh, there's plenty of myths, some of the myths that are perpetuated by what we could call the elite in our society about uh, economics, about consumption, about all kinds of things that are just myths which are not helpful and not supportive and are just destructive. And how do we stand up to that? How do we speak up about that? And what's the right way to do it, the appropriate way, and ethical way to do it? The Buddha did. So maybe it's okay for us to do it. So um, if you want to discover who you are, spend some time in nature. And you might try meditating in nature as well. So Earth Day, tomorrow, please think about it. Thank you.